Hello, global gardeners. It is Monday. It's time to start your gardening week by talking about gardening. And of course, I say this every week. I can do that for hours every day if given the opportunity. So let's do it for the next 90 minutes. We have a special guest today. Let's go ahead and not delay. Put her on. It is Jane from Jane's Growing Garden on the YouTube channel. Great to have you here, Jane. Hi, Scott. Lovely to be here. Very early in the morning for you compared to us over uh, here in, uh, in England. Yeah, it's it's relatively early. It's it's 9 a.m. for me here in Colorado. And I know it's about four o'clock in the afternoon for you there in England. For those of you that aren't familiar with Jane, Jane has uh, a, a small channel on YouTube, but it's a wonderful channel. I really like it. And we've had guests from Scotland. We've had guests from Canada. We've had guests from Wales. And you're the first guest that we've had from England. So you are paving the way. <laughs> I feel like I should be wearing a crown or something like that. But yeah, yeah, that's interesting because you imagine that you would have had someone over before. But let's hope I'm the start of many. I hope so, too. Yeah, I made the mistake many, many years ago here in the U.S., uh, we, we learn about English history and everything that, you know, has led to the United States development with the English coming mm -hmm. over to colonize our, our country. And really, I can't remember any point in my education that I was taught that England is not the UK, that the UK yeah. is totally different. And so I made a mistake when I when I first was chatting with Tony O'Neill from Simplify Gardening, and I I mentioned him being from England, and of course <gasps> he corrected me right away to let me know that he was <laughs> from Wales. Did. Yeah, and and yeah. so I was much later in life before I realized that England's a country and Wales is a country and Scotland is a country and yeah. and yeah. Uh, it's no different than the way we look at Canada as a different country. So. Mm -hmm. um, it, mm -hmm. It's definitely quite educational. I want to give a shout out real quick to Eva Nichols Art, a new member of the Gardner Scott community. So it's nice to have you here, Eva, in Truckee, California. And I actually grew up in Reno, Nevada. So I'm very familiar with Truckee. And my college roommate actually lives in Truckee. So nice to have you here, Eva. Uh, so for all of you who don't know Jane, and we'll spend the next hour and a half talking and chatting about different things, by all means, ask your questions in the comments. But Jane, you do it all. You, you have your <laughs> vegetable garden. You've got your flower garden. You've got a garden shed. You do the pond for wildlife. You save seeds. And you do what I think is an important aspect at the end of the season. You do food preserving. And so oh, yeah. as we look at your gardening experience, uh, talk a little bit about that, how you actually approach your gardening season with so many things that you are interested in and, and active. I, I think from, from where I am now to when I first started gardening, I mean, I've been gardening since I was, you know, teenager, started doing a bit of gardening here and there. Parents loved gardening go away to college, it, it tails off a bit, met my now husband, he was interested in gardening as well. As soon as we got a chance, we got a bit of a plot, did a little bit, kids come along, you don't have time for it, kids leave home. And we're now in the position we are, say for about the last eight years, where we've actually had time to expand all those things that we've learned along the way, little bits and pieces, and we are developing as we go and it's 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 evolving everything has evolved so when we first started gardening we didn't have all that stuff you know you would grow a few vegetables and then even now year on year at the end of the year we say that's it now we don't need anything else we've got it set <laughs> we've got everything we want and you know what it's like you start to think actually wouldn't that be good and so we have evolved if you like organically to the stage where we are now and like you say we we have got all those things now but they haven't been something we just started and thought that's it we're going to have all that 
it has developed. And yeah, there's, there'll always be something else. And that's what keeps it really, really interesting. But yeah, I, I think that's what's great about being a gardener is it still feels strange to call myself a gardener, you know, because yeah. I, I'm, a te I'm a teacher, you know, I, I did art history. I never set out to be a gardener, but it's, yeah, it's that interest and that excitement about the next thing. You never, to say you're never quite satisfied, that's wrong. There's a lot of satisfaction, obviously, yeah. in what we do, or we wouldn't do it, but there's always something new. There's always that excitement and yeah, so. So yeah, so we, we do we sort of cover most aspects now, but there'll always that's be good. something else. Well, and, yeah. and I love I love the way that you answered that because uh, that's that's the way I look at it. I I've been gardening for decades, but I never imagined all those years ago that I would become a gardener. That it would be yeah. so much, and it did. It's very insidious. It starts off with oh. with a bed, maybe two, and then like you say, every year. You decide, well, next <laughs> next year I'm going to try something different. And then suddenly a couple decades have gone by and you realize <laughs> that you are so fully immersed in gardening, in your life, that it. I think it's easy to call ourselves gardeners when we finally get to that point where yeah. we start dreaming about gardening and we wake up in the morning and the first thing we think about is what we're going to do in the garden today. Yeah, yeah. And what a wonderful place to be, isn't it? it it's just, And I wonder as well if the fact that you have seasons slightly different to us, but you still have your winter season. I wonder if that's got a large part to do with it because we have, say, at least two months of the year where you can't actually get out in the garden and do much at all. And that yeah. two months, it can be so frustrating. But in your head, right, this is it. You start planning and that's what you're doing. You're planning the garden, you're sorting your seeds and all that. So there's plenty of time to think about it still. Yeah. Yeah, for me, that two months is actually closer to five months. And so <laughs> it is It is so hard here in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I had a, another comment. I get comments occasionally because I, you know, I've been making videos for years. I make videos throughout the year and I like being in the garden. I think being in the garden, regardless of the time of year, even if there's nothing growing, yeah. I get pleasure from being in the garden. And so I get these comments because because. 40% of my videos in the garden, there are no plants growing. It's winter here in Colorado for a month. And, and so the comment will be, why isn't anything growing in your garden? Or how come everything is dead? And it's like, because it's December in Colorado. And in Colorado. The way it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you but have I, perfect but marshmallow growing weather. You, you can grow those that's marshmallow right. trees. That's, that's fantastic. Right. And that, that is the nice thing. And, and I can grow spaghetti. Spaghetti too. You probably haven't seen that video, but but yeah, spaghetti yeah. needs the snow to be able to grow too. Wow. So it, it yeah. all works out well. And so as we look at all of these things you do, and and I know this may be like asking which of your children is your favorite. Uh, which aspect of gardening is your favorite? What what <gasps> do you prefer? Or I should maybe it's a better way to to frame it is what do you spend most of your time doing? in the garden because of the pleasure it brings. Oh, that is so hard because there are the mechanics, aren't there? There's your seed sowing, there's your harvesting, there's, you know, there's the mechanic. But I think, and this is gonna sound really frilly, but it's when that garden hits sort of May, June, July, and you can just sit. And uh, the way I garden, I like to have the, insects the pollinators I like to have the birds and and you can just absorb that atmosphere and there's you might not think it consciously but there's that to going back to satisfaction I created this I created this environment I'm not just going and walking down a line of vegetables and thinking which is which is fine which is great but thinking right okay I'm going to pick those vegetables today it's more than that and we were talking earlier Scott it's, it's sort of quite quite a holistic thing yeah. my gardening and my gardening thoughts they sort of there to create a whole environment rather than just doing one thing or the other thing which is you know why we've expanded to do all these different things Absolutely. it's easier easier to say my least favorite okay <laughs> preserving they're oh, preserving really? well 
it's great to begin with, isn't it? It's oh, great. Sure. You've got how many pounds of tomatoes can you deal with? And you start off and you might do a video or two and you're looking for good ideas. That's a great idea. When it comes to about your third week of not being able to see your kitchen worktops because you've got to, yeah. it can be a bit of a chore. And I think people it, don't count for that can. very often. Yeah, uh, 20 years ago when I became a master gardener and was very active in the master gardener program, teaching classes and the the extension agent, the programs that we have here in the States and in Canada uh, are, are run by universities and they teach Ooh. gardeners to become master gardeners. But then there are many other aspects of the extension service. And one of them is food, nutrition and uh. preserving. And so the agent of, <clears throat> of that part of extension actually asked me to become a master food preserver. And so I'm, I was a master gardener and then I became a master food preserver 20 years wow. ago. And so I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've, I've preserved so much for so much of the, the years I've been gardening and much of what I grow, I grow with the intent mm. of preserving it because, oh, yeah. you know, we, we got to have it. Yeah. But during that, that key season, I'll have, 30 pounds of tomatoes. And after the first 15, it's like, I just, I just don't really need it to do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all of the drying and, and I'm doing freeze drying now. I love freeze drying. Okay. Um, but, it, but yes, I will agree with you. I don't know that it's my least favorite, no. but I think it is something that, that gardeners should look into. They should consider yeah. it. It may be more labor than they're used to with the rest of the garden. And, and is that kind of the way you look at it? Is it just, it, it gets I think old? So. It does get old. But then again, like you said, if you've got five months of nothing growing in the garden, you'll be very, you know, very used to this. When you haven't, when you can't just go and pick something fresh, to know that you've got that thing. Okay, you might have preserved it three, four, five months ago, but ah, that's just great. That's great. You know, never mind the quality. Never mind it's organic. It's just something that you've created. And Absolutely. It's just fantastic. Yeah. So that's one I of the things. That, Sorry. I was, I was, I was just going to say it's one of those things like at the freeze drying. Uh, and, and, and I've got a video on it. And so uh, I grow zucchini over over mm -hmm. Jean for you. And yeah. we were talking about this actually uh, at, at Danny's live a few weeks ago. And I love making bread from the zucchini, a sweet bread with the zucchini. Ooh. Well, normally I will shred up the zucchini and freeze it so that during those cold months I can make that nice zucchini bread. Now what I've done is I freeze dry it and put it into my pantry and then open up a little packet and add some water and add all the other ingredients. And I can have delicious garden fresh zucchini bread at any time of year. And it's particularly nice over the holidays to have a cup of tea and some of this sweet bread. So that that's the part about preserving that I like the best. Does it taste? Does it taste okay when you freeze dry? Does it taste the same? Oh, yeah. Does it retain? It doesn't get really watery when you have to re... No, it's just the opposite. So, so the, okay. the, the freezing actually breaks down the cells within <coughs> the, the oh. vegetable. It does get really yeah. watery. It gets mushy. It, you can still make the bread with it, but it's just not the same. Tastes good. The, the yeah. freeze drying actually takes out all of the moisture. Okay. So all yeah. that's yeah. left behind is the structure. And then okay. when you add water to it, it rehydrates and it looks and tastes and and there's there's a consistency difference, but for the most part, feels just like a, a freshly grated uh, vegetable. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. It's, yeah, yeah. I've never. I mean, air dry or dehydrating. Uh, yeah, that's different. So I do a lot of dehydrating. That's air, and then I do air drying of my herbs as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you've got every. You are the master preserver. <laughs> I, well, I've yeah. got a lot to learn. I've got a lot to learn. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I love it. I've I've taught classes yeah. on how to can and how to to. I love making jams and jellies. That's actually my oh, yeah. favorite part of the preserving. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I've taught classes on dehydrating and all that kind of stuff. And so okay. that's a big reason why I do it. So anyway, back yeah. to you. 
or garden, I, I uh, see on your channel uh, mm. on a fairly regular basis. <laughs> your husband is out with you. So many of us are yes. solitary gardeners because the rest of our family doesn't have the same interest. So this is a chance for you to to talk about your wonderful husband who you said is retiring this year. And, and oh. so, so let's talk about that aspect because that's something that I haven't really covered in my videos or on these live streams. I've talked mm. about gardening as you get into retirement. Mm. But mm. now why don't you share with us some of your thoughts about gardening with your spouse in <laughs> retirement and what, what you think... are planning to do. Oh, well, it's all, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, Mike is, um, he's been working in education now for X amount of years. So I was just saying to you before, Scott, I said to him, people are saying, you know, oh, when you retire, be careful. It's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. You've got, you know, suddenly got the days, one leads into another. No, he's just so keen to get up to the allotment. And he has been interested in gardening since we got together, but he came from it from a slightly different angle. My parents were very much 1970s, very neat gardens with not a weed to be seen and perfect soil and flowers, no vegetables, you know, until a little bit older. And then Mike came from uh, a background where his uncle's just the whole back garden was turned over to potatoes and leeks. Um, they're in the northeast of England. They are the things that grow really well up there. And he said it was very, as I was saying before, it, it was very functional. It wasn't a garden, whereas mine would have been seen more as what you might call a leisure garden. Okay. His was a very functional garden where you wouldn't go out and sit and sunbathe or whatever, but you'd go out to pick a couple of leeks, a couple of potatoes. So, but he always had that interest. He was always fascinated to see his uncles planting and growing. So when we got together and we got a little bit of, I'm saying a bit of land, it was our backyard. And in England, a backyard is literally a few paving slabs outside before you get to the garden. And yeah. we started growing things in pots and we both had the same sort of interest. But what's interesting now, what we're really lucky with is our allotment site is quite big. I never know the exact figures, but it's, I would say it's about 30 feet wide. I might be way out here. It's about 30 feet wide and about 120 feet long. Okay, that is so big. It's, it's, quite, it's quite big. And um, so we can go to different areas and we clash on a lot of levels in that, I will try and organize something. I will write a plan. I will draw a plan and I'll say to him, okay, Mike, if we can do this here, tick it off the plan. And Mike, but I might not go and actually do the task, but I'll have a plan and it's in my head to do. Whereas Mike will actually go and do the task and then come back and look at the plan and say, oh, I didn't realize. So <laughs> he's very hands-on. He'll do stuff without thinking of the planning. I'm very planning or... But in the end, it all knits together. And Good. on my latest video, I was saying that one thing and another, I've not been able to get up to the allotment as much as I'd like to over the last few weeks. And I went up to do my April tour last week. And uh, the polytunnel is just full of seedlings. And Mike says, yeah, I put a few things in. I think this is, it's like the garden fairy has been and done all that work for me, you know. And, and so... Right. It comes together. It comes together. And we can both go up and spend the whole day up there, not necessarily speaking to each other, not in a terrible way, but just yeah. enjoying it in our own way. And nice. get together, sitting around the table, have a coffee. And to have that same passion as the person that you're with, it's you're just very lucky. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. And, and I look forward to seeing the videos as, you know, because right now he... I don't want to say he plays a, black, a background role in the videos, but uh, <laughs> he's always but, in the background. But he's I'm always, he's always in the background. He is, he is, yeah. he is. I'm blessing very often. I'll, um, he's got all sorts of projects. I mean, his latest project that he's getting involved with is he wants to do a watercress bed. And so we're going to film him from the start. We've got an old bathtub. It's not very nice, but hey, that'd be a great place to do watercress. So yeah, he was talking about it on the last video, but very often I'll film him telling me about something he's done. And when it comes to editing, 
well, I'm terribly sorry, Mike, but that video was too long and something had to go. <laughs> it's quite a lot. I should put them all together like a compendium of Mike, but he was always, he didn't want to be on the camera for a long time. You know, he's very camera shy, as I think we all are to an extent when we begin, you Often, know. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, but now he's getting more confident. So yeah, hopefully as he retires, we'll, we'll see a lot more of him. You know, he's got a lot to say. He's, he's, he's a good fella. Good, good. You're very lucky to, to have that. Uh, shout out to Grow Big TV, Joe and Corky over there. There have a, a great channel. And he's, or she, I think this is probably Joe today, asking, do they have classes? And I think that's probably talking about gardening classes in the school curriculum in the UK? Not as far as when I left primary school teaching, so up to the age of 11, I left a few years ago. The only bit of gardening that was covered actually in the curriculum was during science. So you might plant a sunflower seed or a bean and watch it grow. And then at the end of the term, you got to take it home. Um, but anything to do with gardening was taught as extracurricular. So you might okay. do a lunchtime club or but, but there were after school. There were clubs and there were opportunities for that in your schools. If if you had the support for it, yeah. Yeah, you would you would be okay. It would depend who was in charge of, you know, sorting out timing and that sort of thing. But uh, but yeah, and and again, Mike teaches. Um, well, he's at a college, a secondary college, so sixteen to eighteen year old further education, and he has been plugging and plugging for them to do some sort of course because they've got a huge piece of land with great big old greenhouses on, loads of equipment. Okay. everything ready to go i'd volunteered to go and teach there was no interest there was just no interest from the people who mattered you know the management didn't seem to want it so i think we really need to push for it because like you say scott we it's our food our food yeah. we could be so much healthier if people knew just how to do it you know they went out there and had a go and knew how to develop their own things so yeah good question i think i think the uk well, I know the UK is actually more supportive as as a group of countries than the United States is. Uh, mm -hmm. You you have flower shows that are broadcast on on national television, and mm -hmm. you have the allotment system that gives almost everybody at least access to the possibility of gardening, and and we have none of that, and so particularly in the schools, it is really difficult to get anything gardening related into an American school. And even if we do, most of the people outside the school absolutely don't care about it. And so as, as you look at with your area, why don't you share a little bit with us uh, some of that? Have you have you entered into any of those shows or is that a big event for you to go to some of the, the amazing greenhouses and the activity? It's the we These have um, there are there are so many each year we have uh, well there's the Royal Horticultural Society which is like the big gardening society mm -hmm. in the UK and they have a series and we don't have anything like that shows. here. Well, this, this is interesting to hear that from you because you all automatically think it's normal and every place will have the same thing, so you sort of take it for granted to an extent. But mm -hmm. they have the same shows on at the same places roughly the same months every year and so the probably the most famous of the chelsea flower show yep have you heard of the Ch yeah there's the chelsea oh absolutely flower show. and yeah and, so, and i've been in i've been in england years ago and you know the chelsea garden show goes on for days and days oh, and days and televised and broadcast yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the big highlight of the gardening season, if you like. But yeah, the RHS, they have shows up and down. And the one I go to is in Malvern, where each year we try and meet up with other social media creators. It's difficult okay. to know what term to call people now. But yeah, okay. so lots of other gardening YouTubers and we tend to meet there. And that's lovely. But they... You nice. tend to have the show gardens, then you've got the displays of the giant vegetables, the flowers, there's, there's like shops there. It, it just caters for everything. There's food, you go for a big day out, some people stay over and make a weekend of it. And yeah, they're quite regular throughout the summer months in, in I'm saying the U UK, 
no, in England. I'm not sure if, if uh, I think Scotland has got a different system now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about Wales, actually. But uh, yeah, we're very, very lucky with that. But there's right through the gardening season, there are shows that are quite easy to get to with just, yeah, your show gardens. Yeah, so much inspiration and experience, you know, out there. So they're, they're great to get in touch with. You. But yeah, I can't imagine not having that. It's well, just... we've got the we've got the United States Department of Agriculture, which is the closest <laughs> we've got to the Royal Horticultural Society. Okay. But the focus here in the states is all on big agriculture, uh, yeah, and, and yeah. farmers. And there's really nothing as far as a and a organization that we're all aware of that brings okay. it actually down to the the home garden level. To the different level, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so you as just as we one. talk, what's that? You need to start. Uh, I should one. start one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got so much free time. I'll get right on. That. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so as we look at your garden, or as you look at your garden uh, with that idea that not that you're competitive or you're, you're going to enter, but what is an aspect of gardening that you are particularly proud of that you, that you showcase what, even not to, to anybody else, just to you, when you walk into your garden, what, ma what makes it special? It's just knowing that when we got up the, our current allotment, we got about five or six years ago. And when we first went, it was it had been sprayed year on year for, you know, weeds, insects. It had been rotivated year on year. Nothing against size of these things is this, if this is what helps you garden. Yeah. But it was dead. It was flat, though you could dig a spit deep and you'd, you'd rarely see a worm so we'd gone from a very small allotment which it had beautiful soil and you could throw anything into it and it would grow but this was a task to take on so to go in now each year on year and i look back at the photographs i think we we've done this we've actually yeah. created something here and yeah I, that's what i'm most proud of it's not one particular area it's just the fact that Maybe someone else won't find it as, as nice as I do. But for me, I've created an area that I can go into and just go, oh, I did this. I did yeah. this. And we go back to satisfaction again, don't you? You know, and just just being part, feeling part of it, you know, you know, feeling at one with it all sounds very frilly, but I'm sure, you know, oh, as no, a girl, I, I, you know I what absolutely, I mean. absolutely agree. In fact, you mentioned earlier the the sitting in the garden. Those are two of the biggest yeah. aspects that that I benefit. I, and mm -hmm. I talked about this uh, in most weeks on, on mm -hmm. this show, having a space in the garden that is designed for sitting a, a table, mm -hmm. chairs, a bench, whatever it is, but just a place that you can go and, and chill Eli from in the garden with Eli and, and Kate channel, they've got their chill oodery. Oh, yeah. And so it's a spot in their garden where they just go and, mm -hmm sit yeah. and just chill and just enjoy the space. And I, I completely agree. And while I'm doing that, sitting in my garden, just listening to the insects, watching the birds, soaking it all up, I, it, I, I do exactly what you're talking about. I look around mm -hmm. me and say, I did that. I built that. Yeah. I planted yeah. that. And, and there's just so much satisfaction <clears throat> in doing it. And, yeah. and there can be much more satisfaction in just observing it and just enjoying it. I think a, a, a lot of times as well, especially if people are new to gardening, and, and we, I, I'm always saying about this, as creators, we're guilty of pushing the whole thing up, right, this is what you do now. This is what you should be doing. Look at this picture. This is what they should look like. And so people can very often feel pressured and they mm -hmm. go to the garden and it, it, it becomes a chore or a race or a catch up. And I think it's so important to just have a space to sit back and just go, just, yeah, the chillutery. I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so John C is saying, I can't imagine having an allotment. I like the garden to be mine and just outside my back door. <coughs> and I, I know there are many in the UK that have that option and yeah. almost all of us here in the United States have that option. And mm. so, when you talk about how much work is involved and you want it to be easy and just going to enjoy the space, 
but you actually have to go to someplace else. You can't <coughs> walk out your back door to get the enjoyment of the garden. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and there's pros is, and cons. Is there an that. aspect? How far is your allotment? How far do you have to travel? Oh, uh, well, if we went in the car, which I've got to say, we very often do because there's stuff that carrying uh, five minutes. If we walked, okay. it's actually a really beautiful walk across hills, across um, the canal. It's just really, really lovely. It's probably about 15 minutes. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's not too far, but but there are pros and cons. I was, ideally, I would love to have, I just open my back door, wander out in my pajamas, have my first cup of tea of the day, all that. But with the allotment, there is a sense of community. If you're lucky, I know there's a lot of sites where people go, oh, there's a bit of aggravation down there. Or the, but our allotment site, we have got that really lovely community. And so that sort of balances it out a little bit. Okay. And yeah, it just, um, I'm, I'm relatively lazy when it comes to day-to-day -day activities and the garden <laughs> and the idea of, getting in the car to go someplace to then <coughs> relax. Yeah, yeah just, it does. It seems it, kind it of often, productive, doesn't it? It does. It's, it's, it kind of defeats the purpose. It's like, ah, uh, and, I, and I know so many people that do this. I'll just sit in my chair and watch television because it's too much work to go enjoy yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah. But, there's, but the other thing, though, Scott, is um, we've got no option. We've sure. got, we live in a Victorian house. Uh, I was mentioned the yard, which is just like a few paving slabs full of pots. And then a reasonable, a, a small garden, I would say 15 feet square. So whereas for many years we tried to grow vertically, we tried to turn bits over to grow in, it just, it faces northeast. So it, it just wasn't working. So as soon as somebody offers you, a space to actually go and grow things you know it's not a, it's not an either or it's a case of yes please you know okay. so yeah that's good well and the development it is just so amazing i did a video i think last year on on earthworms the different types of earthworms and mm -hmm. encouraging earthworms into the garden and when i first moved to this this house i'm at now and started gardening there were no earthworms like like you were talking about with your lot yeah. digging in yeah. and finding nothing and then I covered everything with thick wood chip mulch. And for that video, and I was really quite worried when I was filming it, I was talking about how that's how, how you encourage earthworms. You give them mm -hmm. organic material that they can, they can eat and yeah. burrow and all of that. And I started digging live in the video mm -hmm. in just an open spot and found earthworms immediately <laughs> upon digging into the soil. Yeah, and, and yeah. And it's like, it, it's fantastic. It's mm. that that life that is just all around you in the garden that yeah. you bring in yourself. Mm. I, that's just mm. so amazing. I know, me. yeah, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's there and we've got to work with it. You know what I mean? It's sort of, yeah, don't, it, I could go off on an angle here and I'm really trying not to, but, yeah, you, you've got to work to an extent, work with what you've got, you know, improve what you've got, encourage other things. We're all part of a, a bigger ecosystem. And if we yeah. can encourage other things to come and help us, like our worms, then great. Yeah. Well, and so one of your recent videos, and for those of you just joining us, I'm with Jane from Jane growing garden in England and has lots of videos on different topics. And so you've done a couple of recent videos on the wildlife pond and, oh, yeah. and adding the pond to the garden. So let's talk a little bit about that encouraging wildlife. And so in your particular part of England, was, was there something in particular, some animal, some bird that you were specifically trying to attract or, or you're just helping out nature? just helping out nature there's, there's various different aspects again it's because we've been there i keep saying for a few years now and the allotment has developed a bit at a time and we've always had this bit at the far end at the top end of our allotment and i've always called it um the natural bit because <laughs> it's just basically hadn't been developed there's a big shed at the top that is used purely for um bamboo canes, netting, so it's purely storage. Um, okay. 
And then, so a couple of years ago, we got the chickens and we said, well, we can use one of those sides to put the chickens in. The other side, we'll put a little patio area, which is where we have our table and chairs, quite private, nice. Behind us, we've got a few fruit trees that were there before we got there. Yep. But it was not a growing space. Um, and so I said to my, I said, you know what? I said, we spend so much time sitting at this table. Let's surround this with, with wildflower or with flowers to bring the pollinators in, you know. And so last year we did that. And I remember sitting there one day and there was, it sounds like I just sit at my table all the time. There is a large pot, <laughs> it does. But there was this incredible, huge moth landed on my verbena the type I've never seen before. It was the size of a hummingbird. It oh, was sure. ridiculously big. And I took, really tried carefully to get my camera out and I got a very wobbly picture of this thing. I thought, what's that? And it got my mind to going, what else comes when we're not looking, when we're sitting really still? And so we thought, okay, we'll get more flowers in. I really wanted to put a pond in because I know the huge benefit that water in your garden any mm -hmm. any size water will will have um but mike is has a really bad reaction to bites from mosquitoes and horseflies so he just said ah, let's not do that and then someone said yeah but moving water they're not going to come near so we thought okay so we've got a very small wildlife pond um we've got some a little solar fountain which i've put in it mm -hmm. which now, i've now taken out of it again because i want to have frogs and apparently Anyway, and we are now developing that. And from this pond in the middle of this unused bit of plot, we are now planting outwards. Everything I'm planting is wildlife nice. friendly to help things come in. And then that has developed even further now to just behind us. We've got a huge tree that we've put a couple of bat boxes on to get um, some hopefully get some bats coming to visit as well. And they will help us with the mosquito Take problem. Take care of so, those mosquitoes. Exactly. It's all, you know, organic. It's all trying to just evolve, you know, and it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. That's nice. And so Heidi, one of our fantastic moderators, along with Jay Dixon, is asking, do you have any animal pests in your allotment? And then I'll add to that. If you do, how do you deal with them? Well, we're not like you. We're not, we haven't got gophers. We have not got gophers, and so far we don't have a problem with rabbits. So, and I know I'm very lucky with that because so many people do, but actually, you know, we're quite lucky. We don't have, I'm saying all this about how I want to encourage wildlife in, and then I'm saying we're lucky we don't have. Um, what we do have though, are oh, we've got insect pests. And so the huge mm -hmm. thing that we have is allium leaf miner which can absolutely decimate your onions and your garlic and your leeks. And so that okay. is the big thing for us. And yeah, so how lucky is that really? I realize as I say it, but not animal as such, unless you include Rocky, the okay. dog, who, yeah, he will often go and dig something you know, and sometimes, up. <laughs> you know, that, that our animal friends and actually create more damage than yeah. the, the wildlife yeah. if they find their way into the garden. So uh, <laughs> we love them. Mala actually just oh, left yeah. my feet. She went outside. <laughs> but uh, it's we, we've got to have them. They're part of the yeah. family. We take yeah. them out with yeah. us. And we just kind of have to accept. This year, I'm going to have to put, my plan at least, is to put a low fence around my vegetable garden area because uh, of Mala. You know, she's, right. she's so okay. good most of the time, but yeah. occasionally she goes digging for a gopher. And whether there's actually a gopher there or not <laughs> doesn't matter. She's going to try. Yeah. She's yeah. going to try. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's the damage that they, they can do that sometimes yeah. is a problem. Uh, I see that Sherry is saying that uh, the quandary is the groundhogs. They burrow yeah. it under fences, for porch foes. And that's one of those things um, I, I have nothing that's even close to a groundhog around here. But uh, in much of the UK, I guess groundhogs are a problem. I, You know what? The only thing I really know about groundhogs, you're going to have to educate me here, Scott, is Groundhog Day. <laughs> I, 
I wouldn't really know what a groundhog was. How big are they? Um, it, it's pretty big. It's it's a big rodent, um, uh, uh, bigger than a gopher, uh, maybe the size of a, okay. a small cat. Okay. Yeah. 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 And not and, a problem. You know, they're in different areas, but luckily I don't have to. Don't worry about that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I can I can visualize them now, but yeah, we no, I've not had them. Not in my, my little corner of England. We don't suffer from groundhogs, but whether there's another name for them over here, okay, I don't know. And, and I don't know. I, 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 I've, I've always assumed they were similar to hedgehogs, and um, and I don't know if that's the the same thing or not, but. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe yeah. Jay will be on top of that and post a link. Uh, Dusty is wondering, <clears throat> do you have an issue with mosquitoes because of all the rain you have? It depends if you call it an issue. It's when we have damp weather, which in the UK we have had damp, damp, damp for what seems like forever at the moment. Um, there'll be areas you walk through. So to walk down to our allotments, it's a lane. It's absolutely beautiful in the summer you've got hedges either side that are full of birds and butterflies it's gorgeous this time of year you walk down the lane has turned to mud and it is just a tunnel of mosquitoes to walk through okay. so you don't talk to someone as you're walking down because you will just get a mouthful of mosquitoes but yeah yeah the damp weather certainly brings them out but we're trying to deal with them okay uh milltown life is helping out Saying whistle pigs. I don't know if that's a oh, term, a term that you're no, familiar with. Not um, at all. But whistle pigs is another name. <laughs> okay, I like it. <laughs> Look at how much we're yeah. learning today. I know, I know, and, and it, it makes and, you wonder how enjoy, they got that name. Enjoy the yeah. garden. Is saying hedgehogs are tiny, so I know the groundhogs they hold up during Groundhog Day, and uh, and I and now. That I think about, I've seen people holding hedgehogs, and hedgehogs are yeah. definitely much smaller than groundhogs, which apparently are the same as whistle pigs. <laughs> so it's an educational show and today. And hedgehogs are cute. Hedgehogs are cute. They are, um, yeah, and they're covered in spikes. But I think now, from what you're saying about groundhogs, they're the equivalent, I would say, to to beavers over here. So, yeah, about the same they, size, maybe slightly they, smaller. They are similar. I know they're all. They're rodents. Beavers are probably a little yeah. bit bigger. Gardens happen yeah. says woodchucks wood are chuck. another name for groundhogs. I don't know if, okay. if you have woodchucks because I hear <laughs> no. that's one of those things, you know, that's one of the first lessons we learn in or one of the first questions asked in in our school system is how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck chuck, chuck, wood chuck, chuck wood? Chuck wood. Yeah. I, I don't know if I knew what a woodchuck was. Yeah, I know now. It's a whistle pig. There you go. So uh, that's fun. So Kevin is saying you guys are going to miss the eclipse. And so we really aren't going to miss the eclipse. Um, the The eclipse here in the United States is going to start, I think, in about half an hour, a little less than half an hour in California. It's going to be moving across the country. It's not going to hit my area. I'm not going to in the full totality. So we're about 80% here in Colorado. Uh and uh, that's going to happen here in a few hours for me. So we'll be off the show. But if you are in California right now, don't forget to get outside and see the eclipse. And as oh, it rolls yeah. across the country, definitely make sure you get out there. And like I was saying to Jane uh, a little bit earlier, make sure you don't stare directly at the sun. <laughs> that's that's a, a, a warning. I'll help out. That's yeah. my service announcement for the day. Um <laughs> But, but yeah. it'll definitely be sun. Yeah, Dusty is saying about two o'clock in Wisconsin. And so that's a little bit farther north and farther east of me. So uh, it is it is a big deal. It, and and I would encourage, and Jay and I were talking a little bit about this before the show as well, get out in the garden. If you are anywhere near the eclipse, even at the 80% or 70% level, Get in the garden. The last eclipse that we had here in Colorado, I was in the Galileo Garden with the, the students, with the kids, and it's just magical. Uh, and so why don't you tell us, because Jane has actually been in the full eclipse, the totality. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Share, share a little bit about that. It was, <clears throat> I was trying to remember the year. I think it was, um, it was early 2000, 2001, 2002. 
may have been sooner. I don't know. It was round about the turn of the century. That sounds very old, doesn't it? Um, but it was the path of totality was going over Cornwall in the southwest of England. So we traveled down. We had friends there at the time and we traveled a couple of hundred miles to go and stay with them. And there was the, a similar build up to I gather what you're having in the States at the moment about, you know, days in, beforehand, people say how they were going to watch it, what it meant to them, etc. And of course, the day came and it was just completely cloudy. And uh, whereas, you know, there was disappointment because we all imagined to see the actual sun disappear in front of our eyes without looking at it. Um, it was cloudy. So there we were. We climbed up a hill with a whole load of other people. And uh, the time came and we thought, oh, we can't see it. You could just vaguely see where the sun was behind the clouds. And yeah, the, the it was saying to Scott, the sheep all sort of heard it and settled down. The birds went quiet. There was just an absolute stillness. And before you knew it, it was like, and the only way I can describe it is like everybody took a sharp intake of breath and we were just transfixed. And then next thing, the sun started to reappear and the birds started to sing and the sheep got up. It was just absolutely magical. And even though I can't remember the exact year, it's still, if I could get to see another one today, you know, I'm not going to get on a plane and pop over there, Scott. I think I'd miss it. Yeah. But, oh, I would definitely recommend it. Yeah, it's a bit of a once in a lifetime thing to see if you can. Yeah. If if you can be in that path of totality and, and maybe someday oh. I'll go somewhere where I can see that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't experienced that. I've, I've had a handful of eclipses that we looked at the partial eclipse. And so most mm. of us, are are going to have that we can still look yeah. with the special glasses and we can see the partial eclipse which which in itself that's what i had in the garden with the kids and yeah. even that is magical just the the mysteries oh. of the universe and you can yeah. be standing in your garden as all these things are happening yeah, uh, I, yeah. I i think it's just it's just so special yeah and, yeah. and so um get back to your garden because i definitely want to, to to talk about your garden uh i I have my peppers, my chilies started. I'll be starting tomatoes this, <coughs> this week. Uh, how much okay. of your garden, because you're a more gradual warming, even though your your spring stays cold, it's still warmer than what I have. Yeah. What have yeah. you started and what are you doing in your garden right now in England? Well, we're zone eight. So I think you're, are you six, Scott? Are you, what zone are you in? I'm at five. Oh, you're a five. five. Okay. Yeah. And we've actually, this year, we have had a wetter and warmer spring. We, in fact, the other day, it was the warmest spring day for, I don't know how long. So we'd certainly go into that yeah. wetter, warmer transition that the weather seems to be going towards. So there's, I've got a few more things started than I, I would normally have done at this time of year. My tomatoes have started. They're just getting their true leaves now. Um, chilies and peppers, mainly the chilies I put in end of January. So okay. they are up. They have just left the house. They've left the kitchen table and gone up to the greenhouse on the plot yesterday. So I feel like it's it's awful. If you, you mollycoddle them for so long and then you put them in the greenhouse. It's right. That's it. You just get on with it. So they are getting on with that now. Mike has done the potatoes, the onions, the brassicas. So we've got our main areas covered, but the things I want to get in this week, I'll be getting my sweet corn in and I want to start getting my flowers in because as, I, as I've said, I love. Now, do you start your corn in. ahead of time and transplant it or are you putting your corn yeah. directly in the soil? Okay. No. See, and, no. and that's another big difference that we have here be between our two methods of gardening. We, I don't know anybody. And here, any of my garden gardener friends who start corn ahead of time and they don't start really? peas ahead of time. They don't start okay. beans ahead of time. Most okay. of what we grow in our vegetable gardens are directly sown into the garden and we don't do much transplanting at all. But but that's because when we get spring, it, it's spring and then it's summer and then it's fall and we don't don't have the drizzly weather and we don't have the overcast and so it is yeah. completely different that that extra week or two that you get probably makes a big difference mm -hmm. 
And I know a lot of people who are, you know, they're, they've planted all their stuff February, mid-February, so they've got everything ready to go out now. But, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that. So do you just have to wait for a few weeks longer and then just yeah. put stuff in? So you yeah. don't transplant anything? That Well, I transplant my tomatoes and my okay. my eggplant. I misstated earlier. Yeah. Eggplant is aubergine. Um, yeah. and, uh, and my peppers, I'll, I'll put those inside and start growing and then transplant them. Uh, but yeah. that's about it. Everything else. And, and I've got a short season. I, yeah. I, I'm not even putting anything in the garden until June. And I usually get my first frost at the end of September and oh. I'm still starting melons and squash and corn and everything <laughs> else from seed, I just have to be careful about the variety. I, I, you know, I choose varieties that are pretty fast growing with a early harvest date. Yeah, that's interesting, that's it. I mean, I'm wondering, our, our last frost date tends to be mid-May. So yeah, really, mm, it's, it's sort of nothing really gets planted out until then. But when I have direct sown beans or direct sown peas, 50% of the time, okay, that's not huge, but they will get got. Talking about animals in the garden before, mice. Okay. I never see them, but the seeds certainly disappear, you know. So how, how do you counteract that? How do you? Uh, and so you do have animal pests in the garden. You've got mice that are eating your-, your Yeah, <laughs> uh, invisible mice, yeah. Yeah, so I don't have a big problem with that. Uh, put the seed in, it sprouts, it grows. Uh, but for those few times that I'm concerned, I just, I have hoops over my beds and I just cover the bed with, with netting mm. uh, or a cloth to, to keep the, the pests out. It does make you wonder if we do molly coddle them too much. I think people are so keen to get things, especially over in the UK, we're so keen to get things started that, you know, you'll plant things early. But ultimately, I bet you if we looked at your beans at the end of June and my beans at the end of June, they'd, they'd be at the same stage. You yeah, know? probably so. Mm -hmm. the the thing i think is is most important and so last year i didn't even get most of my plants in the ground till the third week of june uh, mm -hmm. because the soil temperature just hadn't warmed up all right and i think that may be a big difference when when my summer hits uh, i'm i'm suddenly getting very warm conditions you know it's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it jumps up to to 90 degrees about 32 c almost overnight and now mm -hmm. the soil is warm and I get full sun and I don't have all those animal pests and, and things just start growing. And so yeah. it, it probably takes much longer for your soil temperatures to warm up to the point where the plants will, will do as well. And I think maybe that's why we have you know, better success but with the direct sowing because the yeah. soil is warmer. Because you have to adapt to, that's what I say to everybody, you have to adapt to what you've got what the conditions are going to be. You know, they're not going to be the same for everybody. Have you noticed a difference in the weather in the last oh, few absolutely. years? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So so I'm in zone 5B, which is uh, minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit, about minus 26 Celsius. Mm. And so that is my coldest winter temperature. And yeah. I, I remember years where we would have regular periods that was that <clears throat> cold or or close to it. And what I've yeah. noticed in the last couple of years, uh, and, and it's really quite interesting, I think, because I keep track of all this stuff. I'm a weather geek. I've got two <laughs> weather stations tracking what's happening in my garden. Yeah, but, master of the weather as well. Master exactly. of the weather. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the low temperatures now that, that I'm experiencing – are closer to uh, zero degrees, about uh, okay. minus 18 Celsius, as the yeah. lowest that we have. Right. And and this year, really the coldest that I got down to with any regularity for just a couple days, it was about uh, 14 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, about minus 10 Celsius. Uh, and yeah. so the winters are warmer, mm. except for one day. And it happened this year. <laughs> Sure, as well. Yeah, yeah. The overall, the winter is warmer. Overall, 
everything is much milder, but we had mm -hmm. a single day that got down to that minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's okay. how our zone is defined. So, yeah. you know, on paper, it looks like we're still staying pretty consistent, but mm -hmm. I am noticing mm -hmm. my winters getting warmer, except for the yeah. occasional cold. Yeah, yeah. And the summers oh. are warmer too. <clears throat> All right, okay. I was going to say, are your summers less? No, but... Well, and so <laughs> when I first moved here to Colorado uh, 28 years ago, I can remember a, a week couple years after I moved here and it was start or starting to get warmer and it was forecast to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit oh, come on now. about 37 what? Celsius okay mm -hmm. and and the reason it was making news is because in in the 150 year history of Colorado Springs there had only been one day <laughs> that had gotten that hot mm -hmm. A couple years later, we had five days that oh, reached wow. that temperature. And so yeah. that's, you know, that's the big difference. We'll have one day in 100 years, and now we can expect a day right. or two of that temperature every single year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, but, it, you know, we have to adapt. That's one of those exactly. things. Exactly. That's what, that's what gardeners do. We recognize what's changing, and yeah. we adapt accordingly. Is, is there a plant that you you just can't grow that you really want to grow? I would love to grow citrus fruit. Um, so your lime, your lemon, your orange, I'd love to be able to grow one of those because we, mm -hmm. we can grow apples and pears like nobody's business. Um, and this year I've got a, a peach tree. I'm trying to grow a peach tree in my greenhouse. Um, whether I'll have any success, I don't know. But yeah, if it was warmer, citrus fruits would be a good one for me because I yeah, just love them. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But again, to grow them in any success here, it wouldn't just have to be indoors. It would have to be a heated space indoors. So yeah, yeah. I think uh, oh, there are so many things though, aren't there, Scott? You know, you just think you've got your, your seeds sorted and someone else will come up with something, usually on YouTube, and you think, Gotta give that a go. I've got to try it. We try right. sweet potato. We try sweet potatoes this year for the first time. Um, nice. So yeah, so we're just we're just getting roots on the potatoes now. Have you tried them before? I did. I did it uh, a couple years ago for the first time. This yeah. they require a very long, warm season, mm. and I actually mm. had some pretty good success with it. I, okay. I made a video about the whole process and how I started, and uh, they were smaller than I had hoped for. But I think that's because my season is just too short. It just started okay. cooling down before most of them could, could get to big size. But did that they was go, a major they, accomplishment that, for oh, me. The, the vines apparently go absolutely everywhere. Is that true? And you might not have any tubers as such, but you've got plenty of green on top. Um, it depends. It depends on the variety. It depends on you know how much nutrients if, if you've if you've got more nitrogen in your soil then you've got the phosphorus the then yeah you're gonna get more green and the roots are gonna be smaller so there is that balance yeah, um, yeah. I my vines weren't as long as I thought they should be uh, oh. but again my my season was cooling at about the time that the vines would have really been growing okay and so I yeah. think it was yeah. more just my climate and and the weather that was happening the time I grew them, but uh, but they're fun. It just like most things in the garden, when you can harvest it and then eat it and realize how delicious it tastes, that's why we do it, right? Go. Yeah, yeah. And Jay's on on top of things, of course. She's every time I mention a video, she's doing a great job <coughs> to list it. So there's a there's my my video planted a supermarket sweet potato, and this is what happened. And, and so last, I did try it again last year. So the successful year, I just grew, or I just bought a supermarket potato, sweet potato, mm. and grew it and it did great. Last year, I actually ordered some oh. sweet potatoes and we were just so late. It was just so cold going into July mm. that that they really didn't. So you grew them outside? They were outside? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. 
Well, we we're literally just at the stage where they're in a little glass with the cocktail six through or the mm-hmm. skewers, and they're in the water and the roots are coming and it's like again probably way too late but we were going to do it in the greenhouse so just leave it to itself leave it to spread because we've got the polytunnel where most things will be growing but the greenhouse will have the grapevine the peach tree and the sweet potato so yeah okay. just again, it's experimenting isn't it it is absolutely and and jay's commenting and i think this is a great tip uh if you put them in and you're, you're concerned about the vines, grow upward. Put a trellis and and have those 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 vines going up. I love trellises. Great I idea. Trellises yeah. A lot. Yeah. 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 Well, and especially so, when we were trying to grow in the garden because so little ground space. Grow upwards. Yeah. Grow up. Yeah. Absolutely. Janet McDonald's wondering to get the right insects to come. Do you eat the flowers and leaves? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but um, so <coughs> what, do you, what do you do or do you uh, make effort to a- attract the beneficial insects specifically? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And what is it you do? I do, it, basically it's flowers and herbs. Anything that I can grow that will attract um, the pollinators in, the, the predators, the things that are going to get you. Yeah black fly and your green fly anything that i can grow to that extent i will do so i have my calendula they're my absolute favorite every year they self-seed everywhere they are absolutely in the summer they are smothered in all sorts of bees i never knew there were that many bees until i started growing them and i've got my herbs so i've got marjoram covered in bees i've got time to get covered in bees so everything i tend to plant flower wise is something that i know will attract insects in however the last year or two i have fallen in love with dahlias and they can be they are completely blousy they are you know a complete i don't know indulgence in the garden but i do just love them and you know they still they still attract the insects they do also attract yeah. snails and earwigs but we can deal with them but that's just my my indulgence but but yeah anything i can to attract insects to the plot for the longest period possible because i think people think of flowers in the plot being there in the late spring summer over into autumn but if you can get things in now so for example, I've got pulmonaria, lungwort, okay. which mm-hmm. is growing now. Um, I've had snowdrops. I've got grape hyacinths. And the bees are out there already on them. You know, so what? always consider when there's a shortage every other time, in other time, you can extend your season for the insects as much as you possibly can. So, yeah, grow from as Absolutely. early as you can till as late as you can. And that really helps. Well, and one thing that that I encourage, and I do it in my own garden as well, is I don't do a lot of weeding. I'll weed the actual beds, mm. you know, mm. when I'm growing vegetables or whatever it is. But so many of what we think of as a weed, and people <laughs> spend a lot of time getting rid of those oh. weeds, that's the yeah. food for our native insects. And ah, so the, those weeds, like dandelions, we have a lot here. And, you know, they start appearing in early spring and people are out mm. there digging up the dandelions. Well, mm. that's the first food for... <laughs> The bees the and bees. many of the Absolutely. other pollinators that we have. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Everything is there for a reason. It is there for a reason. Sometimes it can get too much, <laughs> but we are we are there as guardians. We are not there to dictate what exactly. should be there, what shouldn't be there. You know. So. And now, do you grow many grasses? Because I've I've learned that uh, <laughs> the landscape grasses, in particular, the tall, tall grasses. They can actually be very beneficial for some of those predators and an overwintering spot. So uh, we've talked about the flowers, but but do you have grasses intentionally growing? Not intentionally. No, I have got <clears throat> what I do, though. I don't tend to cut my plants back um, until. Oh, I, I cut my lavender back about a week ago. So I leave all the okay. dead stems on. So it doesn't look tidy, but those dead stems are brilliant. I mean, ladybirds, you, you get so many nesting, yep. if you like, living in those. Um, but no, grasses is something, it's never actually appealed to me. However, 
if I find out that there are particular grasses that are going to benefit the plant in some way, then yeah, I, I'd like to hear about them because every little helps. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and they add a, a visual contrast. So you've got the, the grass and you've got your flowers and, and I have everything interspersed, but especially around your, your new pond, you the might pond, consider absolutely. putting some, some tall grasses yeah. in. Yeah. Just a yeah. Thought. It's a uh, <laughs> always trying to get new ideas. Rockstar1734 is asking about raspberries in a container, a half wine barrel. And wondering, should I limit the number of new canes growing from the container, or will they do fine with a dozen or more new ones? My raspberries, coincidentally, have just started sprouting. There's little leaves at the surface. It's just so wonderful in spring when I see that. I tend to let them grow. I think, at least for my raspberries, they kind of self-prune. That They'll clump, but if there are too many of them... Um, the, the particularly the inside of the clump will die out. Uh, are you growing any canes, any um, bramble we, crops of any time? Oh, yes. We have got a thornless blackberry that I thought would be a great idea to grow over an arch, just talking about growing upwards, because uh, I thought it won't take over the plot. It'll be fantastic to keep it on. It's an absolute thug. It's, <laughs> it's grown so much. I had a, a blackberry growing up one side and a tayberry on the other side, they thought, oh, it'll look lovely when they meet at the top and I'll be able to wander through and pick the fruit. Oh, no, it was the tayberry has is stayed quite small, but the blackberry already is right the way over the arch onto the other side. But the worst thing is it seems to have sapped all the nutrients from that particular bed. So anything I grew in that bed last year didn't do very, very well because the blackberry was that vigorous okay. so i was going to move it and then basically i just haven't so i've decided i'm going to give it another year um see how it does it gives me a good harvest this year great i'll keep it there but it didn't even give me a particularly good harvest last year okay. so i'm just going to grow maybe some flowers just things that are quite strong things that can fend for themselves in that particular bed but i've got those we've got raspberries but our raspberry the fruit cage um, a friend gave us some raspberries and yeah be really careful if someone offers you anything check the roots because oh. we were given raspberries and now we've got ground elder in the fruit cage and that oh. is a pretty horrible weed it's not the worst but it's a pretty horrible weed to keep on touch with in touch on top of but it's we have dug those raspberries up put a uh, cardboard over the ground elder we're just going to let that sleep for a year and the raspberries are now in tubs so we've got two or three in each tub so that's why i'm um, that's an interesting question and and what you said scott because i'm thinking well how long will they get how long will they be okay for in there but i think that again they're fairly robust aren't they these are autumn yeah. fruiting ones as well so they okay. they're pretty good so when they're and they're that, easy to transfer plant and they're you yeah. know they're easy to dig up so if they do start taking over the the vat or and you know a container it's easy to just dig a few up and start a new they're quite shallow or, rooted, or aren't or they? Yeah. Yeah. Area. yeah yeah but yeah that's a yeah, good tip if somebody yeah. gives you something much as it's absolutely wonderful and i'm all for sharing do check absolutely and and tony's got some good advice here um yeah He's saying, if I'm given any plant, <clears throat> I always bare root it and wash the roots to minimize yeah. any hitchhikers. <clears throat> Great advice, Tony, as always. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's that's one of those things. And even it's it's not even just when somebody gives you something. I had I ordered some strawberries from a company uh, a, a few years back and it came from a nursery. And, mm. and they were contaminated with an ivy of some type that oh. tried to take over the bed. So, <gasps> so always, always be careful. And Check. if you can mm. wash off the roots and then start from scratch so you know there's mm. no hitchhikers, as Tony says, that, yeah. that's definitely, yeah. definitely a it's good approach doing. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. What is and, your, what, sorry, sorry. Sir. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. What, what is the worst weed that you have to deal with? The worst weed I have is bindweed. All and right, okay. It it 
it's one of those I I and I think it came in from a plant that someone may or may not have given me. I don't remember because I didn't really have a bindweed problem when I first moved to this house about five years ago. But mm. now I've got some areas that it's starting to pop up. And it could be one of my neighbors has bindweed and the seeds are just blowing in. Mm. Mm. But, it's but pretty that's though. one that you just have to stay on top of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it is. It, it's got kind of like a heart-shaped leaf. And it's got nice little white flowers yeah. and and it, it's related to the morning glory, oh, yeah, I yeah. think. And so it, it's a wonderful plant until it starts taking and over exactly. and strangling everything. We've got a wisteria growing up the front of the house and it's it's quite established now. It's been there for about 20 years. So it's got good, good thick trunks. And uh, every year we have bindweed in the front garden. Again, very small front garden. But, every, you know, you see the bindweed, you pull it up. I'm not going to dig in my front garden for every little bit. So I just pull it up as I see it every year. I mean, the boosteria is about to start flowering now next week or two. And it puts on such a beautiful display. There is always a white flower about 15 foot up. And you think, how did you get up there? And it's the bindweed. You don't see it until it flowers. It just really quietly goes all the way up the trunk, you know. So, yeah, but we've got to live with some of these things, haven't we? Well, but but you're right. I think uh, the best approach is to learn to recognize it. And mm. when you see it pop up, I'm constantly doing that in yeah. in in my front. I see it pop up and mm. I just bend down and pull it up. Yeah. And yeah. I know there's still a lot of roots down there. But eventually, <laughs> if you pull up every little seedling that emerges, it's going to drain yeah. the roots. You and, would hope so. Mm. And you hope. I mean, we're talking years before yeah. that happens. But, <laughs> we but live in that, hope. But we live yeah. in hope. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of what we do. Uh, and so as you're starting your 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 season ahead, particularly um, with Mike retiring, what are some of the big projects or the big... Because uh, <gasps> we started the show talking about every year there's something new and and the gardening journey is always learning and always trying. So what's on your agenda for this year ahead that that is new or big or special? The new things, the wildlife area, as we're now calling it, as opposed to the wildlife wasteland, that's been rebranded. So that, that yeah, that will be being developed more. We've got the watercraft, watercraft bed clearly being developed more. Mike has been given um, or has been allowed to share a quarter of a neighbor's plot. Um, so he's like, it goes back to the question you're asking before about, you know, how easy or hard is it to work with your partner? Uh, yeah. So he very often will go off to his little area and he's doing a proper big squash patch. So we've got so many different sorts of squash, which may all self pollinate, you know, they might cross pollinate, and we'll all end up with, I don't know what sort of things coming up, but he's got that area he's developing. But I don't know, Scott, it, again, we keep thinking we're done. We keep <laughs> thinking that's it. And then there's, there's just, especially in this world of social media, there are so many inspirations out there. It, it's difficult to say that's it. What about you? Have you got any big plans? Oh, I've actually got some big projects. So, so I'm, when I moved in four and a half years ago, I developed a five-year plan, oh. and this is the fifth year of my five-year plan. So I have some com some construction. There's an area oh. just just outside my greenhouse that I want to turn into like a little secret garden, and oh, so no. I'm going to put some fencing, some lattice fencing around that area, like just a one way in through a little gate. And then start developing that area with, mm. with with herbs and flowers and create like a little yeah. sitting space uh, as, yeah. as a secret garden. So that's my big project this year. <laughs> but I still have a lot of pathways to develop. I have a lot yeah. of borders to develop. And so I'm going to try to do a lot of that that construction this year to, yeah. to actually yeah. make my garden look like a garden. I've got plants every year, but it doesn't necessarily look like a traditional garden setting with the 
clearly defined paths and clearly to de clearly defined garden areas. So mm, uh, mm. you'll be seeing a lot of those videos coming as I'm yeah. on my hands and moving stone and pushing wheelbarrows and all, all the rest of that. So I, but Marla, I love that part. Marla in the background, digging up all the freshly planted plants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. She, she has a, a good, a, a good ability to know where yeah. I'm filming and then to walk by in the background <laughs> And like every shot yeah yeah like mike <laughs> there, there you go that's right there you go. yeah yeah but it is that's what keeps us in you'll have to do a new five-year plan then will this be completely new or will it be an extension to become a 10-year plan well so this is all part of the plan ah, <coughs> the, okay. the the plan the five-year plan is the construction okay. the the backbone of the garden putting yeah. in the hardscape the fences the 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 pergola I put in last year, mm -hmm. the greenhouse I put in the year before. So every year it's some major construction aspect yeah. to get the, the structure of the garden built. Mm -hmm. But then, but the next five years, I've already started working on the next five year plan. That will be the plants, you know, up All till right, now, yeah. you know, I've, I've got the pollinator flowers and I've got the vegetable garden and I've got the, mm -hmm. the fruit bushes, but, but it's, Again, it's kind of the basic structure. So around mm -hmm. my pergola, I have four quadrants, about 12 feet by 12 feet, each of them. The growing space okay. is nine feet by nine feet. And in one quadrant, I've got currants. And in another quadrant, I've got gooseberries. Oh. And then in another quadrant, um, I've got the... Um, uh, we call them choke cherries here, aronia. And, and it's right, just a, okay. a real small fruit. And then I've got honey berries in the other quadrant. And so it's a it's a nice space, 12 feet yeah. by 12 feet, but that's all that's growing in it are the four bushes. Okay, okay. Well, now the next phase is what to do with the rest of that space, the ground covers and the low flowers and, yeah. you know, the the garden ornaments. And so, so that's the whole next phase is that... Mm the extra stuff that actually fills in the space and, and makes it a true full garden. Yeah. 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 So it's another story. I always exactly. think of your rainforest and your different stories, you know, working for different things. So yeah, yeah sounds yeah. good. Sounds good. Do you have to net your, your fruit? I do, but, but it's more for the deer. I've got deer that wander oh, okay. through the garden. And so I use bird netting, I haven't had a problem with the deer or with the birds eating any, any of my fruit, but I've had a problem with the deer. And so I net, uh, I net my trees, my fruit trees to keep the deer away. And then I put wire fencing around the, the fruit bushes with okay. a little bit of netting to keep the, yeah. the deer off as well. Yeah. I lost yeah. almost all of my strawberries last year to the deer eating them. Oh no. Oh no! Yeah. It's uh, we pigeons are our equivalent of deer. I expect we um, you turn your back, and they'll be eating the strawberries. So again, they have to be netted. And in yeah. my head, I don't want to net anything. I want it to be this beautiful picture. But you know, some things you, you just have to. If you want to have some of them, you just have to net it. You know. Yeah, and it's it's extra effort. I think that you know that's one of those things that that differentiates you and I experienced gardeners from the new gardeners who, who haven't learned yet that gardening takes a lot of work. If you want to keep mm. the birds from eating, or if you want to keep the deer mm. from eating, or if you want any particular problem to be resolved, it takes some effort. Mm. Mm. It is, it is. And it's, um, yeah. And, and that's why you can't expect to know it all when you start. And that's where people get frustrated, you know, I don't know. I find that people, they might be embarrassed to ask a question. And I'm still asking questions. You know, I'm asking yeah. what a groundhog is. <laughs> but you, people are embarrassed because they think, oh, no, no, it'll look like I don't know anything. It's not. We're, we're all learning. You know, I, if I still wasn't learning things in 10, 15, 20 years time, I think I'd be bored. I think, you know. Oh, absolutely. I think if you, my my general philosophy is, 
If you can't learn something new in the garden every single day, mm. then you're not doing it the way that yeah, you get right. the most benefit. Yeah. And it, and it's always something new. It's it's <coughs> uh, a couple of days ago I spotted my first ladybird, my first ladybug. Ah. And it was on my raspberry canes. I was pruning back the mm. raspberry canes because they're starting to appear. And and the ladybug was there. Now, normally, most years, the first place I see them is on a, on a dandelion. All and right. So okay. that got me thinking, well, what yeah. what is it about? And it, and it wasn't just one. There was another one. Okay. And it's like, OK, why why are they on my my dry raspberry canes? Mm. Instead what did they from it? Pandemic. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. the best I figured out was protection. It it was it, a cold, it, windy day, and that was a spot they could hold on to to yeah. to, to not blow away in the wind. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. You know, it shows so, it. Yeah. And it, it's it, it's that observation of what you've got around you because again, what works for you, if someone asks you a question, you can give the advice of what works for you. It right. might not necessarily work for them. And that the only way of finding out, you know, ask, try things, but it's trial and error a lot of the time. You know, Absolutely. but don't be afraid to ask. You know, that's how we all learn. Well, there are so many things about gardening where one gardener will say, you definitely have to do it this way. And the other oh. gardener will say, oh, no, never do it that way. Do it oh, this yeah. other way. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> all of our gardens are unique. And you mm. got to do exactly what you said. Do what works exactly. best for you. Mm. And if it works, then it's the right thing to do. Right. right? Yeah. 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 That's the thing I've been on the allotment talking about the community before. Uh, the person next to his off lot neighbor is completely no dig, very wildlife friendly, absolutely beautiful garden, lots of ornamentals, really. It's like a magazine in summer, it's just beautiful. And the person next to her is the rotivator, the chemicals. And he'll come to us and say, he'll laugh and say, for example, dandelions, what are you letting that do there? Do, 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 do. You need this spray, you know. But we can talk about it and we can get on with each other. It's not divisive and it should never be divisive. But you've got to have the courage of your own convictions and do what's right for you, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to kill all your dandelions, kill all your dandelions. Yeah. If you want to let your dandelions live, let your dandelions live. If you want to make dandelion wine, make oh. dandelion wine. Yeah. Yeah. We did have coffee you, once. Have you, okay. That's what I was starting to ask is what you, yeah. Some of those yeah, fun yeah, yeah. Things that you've done. Yeah. Dandelion roots dry out and apparently tastes like chicory. It was absolutely revolting. <laughs> <laughs> It was really not very nice at all, but yeah, but every single part of the dandelion can be used, you know, and yes, You're it's right. so maligned, this terrible weed, but it's such a valuable thing, you know, so yeah, we could do with a few less of them, but you know. Well, I'm glad to hear that because because I, I love that. I think the the experimentation, not only of what we're growing, but how we use it. Yeah. After yeah. it's growing is great. I'm glad I'm glad to hear you attempted mm. to make coffee with dandelion roots. That's Horrible fantastic. Coffee. Yeah. And so so kind of playing on with this, Frank is asking uh, at my job, the frustrating question I get is about mushrooms and how to kill them, getting them to stop and understand they're turning wood and dead material into soil. And I completely agree. I get that question um, too often about mushrooms the assumption being that mushrooms are bad but mm. they are such a critical comp component of soil with the uh, mycelia networks breaking down all that woody material mm. and and so Ed, as you're moving through your journey i i'm just fascinated by soil and what's in it and and a good soil has both the fungi and the bacteria uh, are, are you a soil geek at all? To an extent, yeah, yeah. Again, it's a whole new world, isn't it? It's there was a book a few years ago. Was it called Fantastic Fungi? There was a book about everything yes, that goes on book. under the soil. Oh my goodness, the network! I, I'm not sure if it was that one that was talking about the way trees 
contact oh, yes. each other as well. There's 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 another great book, um, the Secret of Trees, or oh yeah, I think this might be the one. I'm there's the yeah. two, and it's talking about all this stuff going on underneath the soil. You think, well, that's just the soil. We are on top of the soil underneath us. It's this dead thing that we just walk on. It's a whole new universe of, of life, yeah. isn't it? It's incredible. And it goes back to the fact that with mushrooms, you know, they have got such a valuable partner. I think in Fantastic Fungi, it was saying without them, without the fungi and the networks, things would be dead, you know. Absolutely. It's, it is fascinating. So that is an, that's an area that actually gets me excited. That's something I'd really like to look into more. Good, good. Sean is saying, I'm filling the bottom half of my raised beds right now with wood. I love mm -hmm. finding some logs with fungi on them and putting them in there. I can only imagine the good that will come from them. And and the good, yes, Sean, you will see good. So I've, I've got a number of videos where when I'm filling my raised beds, I I put the logs and I put the branches at the bottom. And it was so fantastic. This one new area of my garden I actually built three years ago and put the logs and everything in. Last year, an abundance of mushrooms in those beds. <laughs> and and it, it was so fantastic to see all these mushrooms yeah. growing because it meant that that wood was breaking down and the yeah. soil was being enriched and that the, the intent for why the wood goes into the beds had been fulfilled. And yeah. so, oh yes, yes. Get, do more, more learning and more, become more of a, a soil geek mm -hmm. because it really does draw you into that world. It is a lot, yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. So, oh, there it is. Jay Dixon says the hidden life of trees. That's the one. Thank that's you, Jay. That's the one, not the secret yeah. life, the hidden life. So yeah, uh, yeah that's just a fantastic book. And I, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Absolutely fascinating with um, how nature just communicates with itself. I know. And it makes us very, that that's the sort of thing that makes you realize you are part of something as opposed to being a dominant thing that will get things to do as they're told so that you can survive. You know, we yeah. are part. And you come back to the eclipse. And that's what's so fascinating about the eclipse, seeing what's above it is all going on. You know, what's going on beneath is amazing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like to... I like to to let the garden tell me what to do. I like to let mm. nature tell me what to do. Mm. You know, I might have a plan for the structure, mm. but when it actually is what plant's going to work or what what insect wants to find its way into my garden, yeah. I just kind of go with the flow and go with mm. the path of least resistance. Mm. If I put in a whole bunch of plants and they all fail, well, then nature's telling me that wasn't a plant that I should be growing. Yeah. It's the wrong Going place. The yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the opposite. Something that you never expected to grow <laughs> suddenly takes up a whole bunch of space. Yeah, yeah. Like, like the bindweed. Well, I want to thank you, Jane. And for those of you that are, are, are joining us late, Jane from Jane's Growing Garden has been our guest today. And it's been so fantastic talking with you. I put a link in the description below to Jane's channel. And I think Jay has posted a link a, a time or two during in the chat. So check out Jane's Garden. The, the, the channel is a small channel. That doesn't mean anything. Jane is filled with information following along with you in your journey on your allotment and all the other things you're doing, I think is, is just so fantastic. And so I so appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Scott. That's very kind. Thank you. And maybe... Someday, I'll get the opportunity to answer 10 questions. <laughs> Definitely. You're on the list, Scott. You're on the list. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, I haven't been high on the list, but... Oh, uh, you will be. Just, just saying. And, <laughs> and so for those of you that don't know, Jane's got a wonderful series of videos where she asks uh, the gardeners you know from YouTube uh, 10 questions. And so... Mm -hmm. If nothing else, check out Jane's channel to to see some of the gardeners that that you've talked to and and yeah. gotten their, their it was take great on fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again, and thank I'm you. sure we'll see you again. And and I 
I hope you'll get a lot new, a lot of new gardener friends on your channel oh, as yeah, we move that'd forward. Be lovely. So Thank you. thanks so much, Jane. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. That was fun. I was so so glad to, to have Jane with us today. And uh, I think it's one of those things when we share our our gardening knowledge, our gardening journey, everything we can do. That's just who gardeners are, is that we are doing the, the gardener thing. And as we move forward in this week, I hope you have a lot of fun with your gardening thing, whatever that happens to be. If you have a chance today in the States to get out and see the eclipse, just do it. And if you can do it in your garden, I think it makes it much more special. I'll be back next week to do this all over again. I'll give you a heads up right now in case you're not going to be with us next week. In two weeks, I'm not going to have a show. I'll be traveling. I'll tell you about that next week, but I'll definitely be back to do this all over again. And as you do your gardening all over again, just remember to enjoy gardening. We'll see you then. <laughs>